This is the Riemann zeta function, one of the most famous unsolved problems in mathematics, with profound implications for our understanding of prime numbers and the structure of mathematics itself. Prime numbers have fascinated mathematicians since ancient times. Take Euclid, who, in around 300 BCE, proved one of the first great theorems about prime numbers. He demonstrated that prime numbers are infinite. Before Euclid, many mathematical concepts were tied to physical reality, and the idea of actual infinity was controversial. Euclid's work helped establish mathematics as a realm where infinite concepts could be rigorously explored. Imagine we could list all prime numbers, p1, p2, p3, and so on, up to some largest prime, pn. Now, Consider what happens when we multiply all these primes together and add 1. This new prime number n must either be prime itself or divisible by some prime not in our original list. Why? Because when we divide n by any of the known primes, we always get a remainder of 1. Therefore, either n is prime or it's divisible by some primes we haven't listed yet. Either way, our original list was incomplete. As mathematicians continued exploring prime numbers, they noticed that primes become progressively rarer as numbers increase. For instance, between 1 and 100, we find 25 primes, a full quarter of all numbers. Yet, between 1 and 1 million, primes make up only about 7.8% of all numbers. This thinning out follows a surprisingly regular pattern suggesting some underlying laws governing prime distribution. This observation led to a natural question. Could we find a formula or function that would tell us approximately how many primes exist below any given number? In the late 18th century, mathematicians like Carl Friedrich Gauss suggested that the prime counting function, pi of x, grows approximately like x over ln of x, this surprisingly simple approximation captures the essence of how primes thin out. As numbers get larger, the proportion of primes decreases logarithmically. This remarkable approximation, known as the prime number theorem, wasn't rigorously proven until 1896, nearly a century after it was conjectured. The proof required the development of entirely new mathematical techniques foreshadowing the deep connections between surprisingly unrelated areas of mathematics. While mathematicians studied prime numbers directly, parallel developments were occurring in the subfields of calculus and analysis that would ultimately prove crucial to understanding primes. In 1734, Leonhard Euler solved a problem that had stumped mathematicians for years, the Basel problem. Named after Euler's hometown in Switzerland, this problem had been posed by the Italian mathematician Pietro Mangoli in 1644. Its difficulty, and the elegance of Euler's eventual solution, made it one of the landmark achievements in mathematical history. The Basel problem asked for the precise sum of the infinite series 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 plus 1 over 16 plus 1 over 25, and so on. Or more formally, the sum of 1 over n squared from n equals 1 to infinity. Euler's stunning solution showed that this sum equals pi squared over 6. I have an entire video talking about this proof that I will link in the description. Euler went further by generalizing the Basel problem. He defined what we now call the zeta function. For s equals 2, this gives us the Basel problem, but Euler's true breakthrough came when he discovered a profound connection between this function and prime numbers. He proved zeta of s equals the product of 1 over 1 minus p to the power of negative s, where the product is taken over all primes p. This elegant formula shows that the zeta function, defined as a sum over all positive integers, can alternatively be expressed as a product over all primes. The formula works because of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, 
the unique prime factorization property that gives primes their special status. This formula, known as the Euler product formula, creates a bridge between the world of analysis and the world of number theory. It shows that information about the zeta function directly translates to information about the distribution of primes. This connection would later prove crucial for Riemann's groundbreaking work. In 1859, Bernhard Riemann published his groundbreaking paper titled On the Number of Primes Less Than a Given Magnitude. In just nine pages, Riemann extended Euler's work in revolutionary ways and set the stage for the Riemann hypothesis. Riemann's innovation was to consider the zeta function for complex values of s. In the complex plane, s has both a real and imaginary component, dramatically expanding the domain of the zeta function. This extension from real numbers to complex is analogous to moving from a one-dimensional line to a two-dimensional plane, providing much more room for mathematical structure to reveal itself. To make this extension work, Riemann had to define the zeta function for all complex values except for when s equals 1. This is what mathematicians call a pole or a singularity. This process, called analytic continuation, is like extending a partially drawn map to cover previously unexplored territory while maintaining all the patterns and relationships from the known region. The extended function behaves in ways that perfectly match the original function where they overlap, but it also reveals new properties that couldn't be seen before. Riemann discovered that this complex zeta function has special points where zeta of s equals zero. Some zeros occur at the negative even integers. These are called the trivial zeros. But the most interesting ones are the non-trivial cases. They seem to lie on the critical line. This is where the real part of s equals one half. These zeros appeared to follow a pattern that was both structured and mysterious, resembling in some ways the distribution of energy levels in quantum mechanical systems. Based on limited calculations, Riemann conjectured that all the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lie exactly on this critical line, where the real part equals one half. This seemingly technical statement about complex analysis is what we now call the Riemann hypothesis. Riemann himself was cautious about this conjecture, noting in his paper that it seemed very probable rather than claiming certainty. He had verified it for only a few zeros, lacking the computational tools we have today. But why does this matter? The location of these zeros provides extraordinarily precise information about the distribution of prime numbers. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, it would confirm that primes follow the most regular possible distribution given their inherently discrete nature. More specifically, the Riemann hypothesis provides the strongest possible error bound for the prime number theorem. It tells us that this approximation differs from the true count of primes by at most the square root of x times a logarithmic factor. Without the Riemann hypothesis, our understanding of prime distribution is much fuzzier. With it, we gain remarkably precise knowledge about how primes are distributed. Many aspects of prime numbers in mathematics are linked directly to cryptography and internet security, where the distribution of primes directly impacts the security of encryption systems. Some mathematicians have even suggested that a proof may require entirely new mathematical frameworks that don't yet exist. The Clay Mathematics Institute even included the Riemann hypothesis as one of its millennium prizes, one of seven unsolved mysteries in mathematics, and if you solve it, or contradict it, you get a million dollar prize. If you like this video, please make sure to like and subscribe.